Well, again, I thank all of you for coming. I know that for uh, many of you, this is your first time in our church this Christmas season, and uh, we're, we've been doing a series of messages this whole Christmas season uh, that we've called The Doctor's Prescription for Christmas, and uh, because we're looking at, at uh, the Gospel of Luke, and the writer of Luke was a doctor, and so uh, one of the men in the church who's a medical professional uh, loaned me his, his doctor's lab coat from when he was in the army. Uh, but my staff didn't think I was worthy enough to wear this because I'm about as far as you can get from a doctor. And so uh, one of them thought it would be funny if they got me my own lab coat and they stitched wannabe doctor on it. So this whole series, I've been a wannabe doctor. But I'm not going to wear the coat tonight because we're relying on the real doctor who wrote the prescription for Christmas, Dr. Luke. Uh, we've read the same scripture every week in this series that Jamie read earlier tonight from Luke chapter 2. And uh, to get you thinking about doctors and prescriptions, every week in this series, I, I've chosen to tell a story about doctors, <clears throat> excuse me, and my sweet wife, Joyce, and uh, who uh, provides more entertainment than one man ought to have, but uh, it, it keeps things interesting. So uh, I've, got to, I've got to start this story by asking you a question. Uh, do you know what the definition of the word diva is? D-I-V-A, diva? Well, one dictionary defines diva as a female dancer. And so you need to keep that definition in mind as I tell you this story. Uh, a while back, Joyce and I had lunch with a lady. And she said that, uh, she said, just for fun one time, when they mailed in their taxes to the IRS, where it asked what her occupation was, she said, I just wanted to see if they really paid attention. So I, instead of housewife, she wrote in domestic goddess. She never heard back from the government about that. So they didn't pay attention. Well, that must have inspired Joyce because the next day I took her to the doctor and it was a new, uh, new doctor. And so give you that, all that new patient paperwork you have to fill out. And so... She filled it all out, and then she asked me to go turn it in at the desk. And as I did, I glanced down there, and where it asked for her occupation, she had written domestic diva. <laughs> I said, Joyce, that's nuts. Don't do that. I mean, you know, I mean, I, if you want to do that, you take it up there. She said, oh, have some fun, you know. They don't even look at that stuff anyway, so just take it up there. Well, dummy me, I took it up there. Gave it to the lady, and you know what? To my great surprise... In that entire doctor's visit, not one person mentioned that. Either they didn't notice, or they didn't care, or my theory is they didn't know what to say in response to it, okay? And, and that's where I stand because she's my wife, and a lot of times I don't understand what to say. So I'm going to call time out in that story right now, and I'll tell you uh, some more of it later, but uh, right now I just want you to hang on to it, and trust me, that in a few minutes, you're probably going to see how that story makes sense as, as we look at Dr. Luke's Christmas story one more time for this season. Jamie read it. We read it every week. So instead of reading it again, I just want to point out some key words that are important for what we're looking at tonight. The key words are in a sentence that the angel said to the shepherds when he announced Jesus' birth to them. He said to them, A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. There are some important words in there. There's some important words that I'm, that I'm not sure everybody understands. And we touched on them Sunday. But I'm going to challenge you with the fifth point of the doctor's prescription for Christmas tonight. It is, is to truly believe the impossible so that you can experience Christmas. In fact, I think you have to believe the impossible to truly experience Christmas. And, and there are a lot of parts, let's be honest, there are a lot of parts of the Christmas story that to our little human brain seem impossible. Uh, but let me, let me challenge you. If the only thing you ever believe is what you can figure out, guess what? You're not going to believe a lot of things that are actually true. For example, a lot of people just, just have trouble with the impossibility of a virgin birth. We didn't read about it, but if you back up one chapter to Luke chapter 1, Luke says the angel went to Mary and said, hey, you're going to be pregnant. Uh, by the power of God, uh, as a virgin, you're going to give birth to a son and name him Jesus. Well, a lot of people 
immediately write that off as impossible because our little human minds can't track that. We can't figure out how that happens. Some people even have trouble believing uh, the simple parts of the story about angels, you know. I don't even know if those things exist. And if they do, uh, surely they didn't come and talk to shepherds that night. But the Christmas story is a story where the impossible became possible. And we don't get to pick and choose which parts to believe in it. It is a package deal that God put together and that Luke wrote about. And so, uh, to, to really experience Christmas, you, you've got to believe that the impossible became possible, which means believing in an awesome God that is above us and knows more and knows all and can do all and that all of these things that we struggle to figure out are, are easy for Him. And he, he made them possible that night in Bethlehem. It, it's like this. If you don't know my wife, you might find it difficult, maybe even impossible to believe that a grown, intelligent woman would put her occupation down in a doctor's office as domestic diva. But let me tell you the rest of the story. The next day, we had another doctor's appointment for her at another new doctor. And, and yeah, you're right. If you're going to the point where on the paperwork again, she put her occupation as domestic diva. And again, I protested to no avail. And uh, she said, don't worry about it. I was right yesterday. They never look at it. Well, this time, we got into the exam room and the nurse who was screening her prior to seeing the doctor actually looked at the paperwork. She's reading along. She said, Mr. Asher, I have a question for you. What is a domestic diva? Does that mean you're an exotic dancer? <laughs> uh, there was no place to hide. I wanted to find a crack or a hole or somewhere and get in it. I, I, it was awful. And then Joyce uh, laughing and, and explaining that uh, it was some kind of joke about uh, being a housewife. And I, I left there hoping and praying that the nurse really believed her. <laughs> because that nurse is married to a pastor in this town. <laughs> Can't you just hear it? Hey, did you hear about that pastor's wife over at the Grace Place? She's an exotic dancer. So if you hear that, don't believe it. Okay? To Joyce, to Joyce domestic diva means housewife, not dancer. But you see, for those who don't know her, I get people all the time, those who don't know her, they ask me, are their stories really true? I mean, they just sound too far-fetched. I'm telling you, for normal people, they're not possible. But they are true exactly as I tell them. And you see, in a serious way, it, people struggle with the, with the impossible when it's so easy for God to do because, folks, God's not normal by human standards. He's way above that. What is impossible for us is possible for Him. But people who don't know Him and people who don't know uh, and believe that the Bible is the inerrant true Word of God sometimes struggle with believing what they can't comprehend. But, but in the hands of God, what we can't comprehend is possible. And God made it come true that night in Bethlehem. And, and the key words are part of the wonder of this impossible story. The words that He is Christ, the Lord. Those are, those are impossible words by human standards. Because when the angel said to the shepherds, He's Christ, what they were saying to those shepherds, hey, this is the Savior that God has been telling about through the Old Testament prophets for thousands of years now, and He's here. This is the one who has come to save the world. Which means you've got to believe that a part of this impossible story is that Baby Jesus grew up to be and do what God said that Savior would be and do. Which means he did the impossible. He lived a sinless life. Which authorized him to be the perfect sacrifice on a cross. And they killed him. And they buried him. Oh, but the impossible happened. 
And he walked out of that grave three days later, alive, and with the power to forgive you, and with the power to, to write your name in heaven's book, because the, pos the impossible is possible with God. You see, it, it, we, have to, we have to believe this impossible story that says there's only one way to get to heaven. You got, you got to ignore the feel-good falsehoods that the world tells you, oh, well, there's a lot of ways to do it. See, a lot of people don't want this to be true. But it is true, and it's possible that Jesus is the one and only Savior. He is Christ. But then the angels tacked on another title. They said, He's Christ the Lord. Now the impossible gets even, gets even deeper. Because when the angels told the shepherds that he's the Lord, you know what they were telling those shepherds? That baby that you're going to go see in Bethlehem is actually God. Now that's impossible. I mean, is it really possible that that baby Jesus was God in the flesh come to be that Savior? Well, by human standards, it is impossible. But not with God. Is it possible that God could really leave heaven and come down here and, and come as the baby Jesus and grow up to be and do what the Christ had to do to, to be the, the crucified and risen Lord and Savior. You see, if you want Christmas, what it means is you have to believe in that impossible. It's like Luke took a prescription pad as a physician. And when he wrote this story, he wrote what we have to believe to have Christmas. You see, once again, let, let me show you, let me tell you, I mean, it, it all boils down to this. What do you want tomorrow? If you want a holiday, then write your own prescription. Make it up. Get a piece of paper when you get home and write down what you want tomorrow to be and, and why it has to be that. And... and Make it about anything you want to. But what Luke is saying is if you want tomorrow morning, if you want to wake up to Christmas tomorrow morning, you've got to believe the impossible. I've shown some pictures throughout this series. I want to show them again tonight because in picture form, it tells the difference between a holiday and Christmas. Those three signs you see on the screen are actual billboards that were placed in New York City this Christmas season by an atheist organization. Who needs Christ during Christmas? Nobody. Well, you, you can X him out. Remember I said you can believe anything you want to if you want tomorrow to be a holiday. And you can make it about whatever you want to. Celebrate the meaning of holidaymas, Xmas, whatever you want to. And then what you end up with is just happy holidays. It's just a holiday tomorrow. But if you want Christmas, I've shown these three pictures that depict the Christmas story until the time that Jesus comes again. The impossibility of God coming in the flesh as baby Jesus is possible in the hands of God. And it happened. The impossibility that he could live a sinless life to be the perfect sacrifice on the cross as payment for my sin and yours. Oh, but it happened because it's possible with God. And then the impossible. They couldn't even keep him in the grave. On the third day, he walked out of there alive. And do you understand what that means? It means that, that it is possible now for us not to fear death. That, that if we believe in the impossibility of this whole story, that Jesus did what he said he would do. He was who he said he was. If we believe in all of that, then the resurrection means that, that he can grant us forgiveness and eternal life with God in heaven. You see, that's why the angels also said to the shepherds, I mean, this is good news of great joy for all people. It's because Jesus came to be the Savior who offered forgiveness and good, that good news of forgiveness and eternal life to all people. But here's the catch. It only becomes your good news 
when you personally believe in the impossible and turn from sin to Jesus. You see, then and only then will it truly be Christmas. Until then, it's just a holiday. And so when I, when I say to you tonight that I wish you a Merry Christmas, this is what I mean. I mean that my prayer tonight, my wish, is that everybody in this room would wake up to Christmas tomorrow. Not because it's a date on a calendar, but because you know for sure that you have turned from the life you had to, the, to believe the impossible of this whole story. And that you've asked Him to forgive you and come into your life. But if you haven't done that, then tomorrow, no matter what you want it to be, won't be Christmas. It'll just be a holiday. And I wouldn't care anything about you if I didn't encourage a room with this many people in it that if you're sitting here tonight and you've never truly celebrated Christmas because you've never truly believed in the impossible, then I encourage you to invite Christ into your heart tonight. Do it right now, where you sit. If you want to talk about that, stay after the service. I'll stay as long as you want to talk with, with you about that because my desire is that you have a Merry Christmas and not just a holiday. I want you to wake up tomorrow and celebrate your first Christmas if you've never believed in the impossible.